started. Good afternoon. My name is Nataki Osborne Jelks, and I am a member of the RCE Greater Atlanta Higher Education Learning Community. And we welcome you this afternoon to our virtual research seminar. We are so pleased this afternoon to um, present to you um, Dr. Pablo La Pena, who is an associate professor um, in the Department of Sociology, Latin American, and Caribbean Studies. Um, at the University of Georgia. I'm, I'm sorry, he is um, an associate professor in the Department of Sociology, but he's also affiliated with the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Institute at the University of Georgia. His topic today is the politics of GM crops and agrochemical exposure in Argentina. If I could uh, just take a moment to read a little bit more about uh, Dr. Lapena's bio. Um, he again, is an associate professor of sociology and Latin American and Caribbean studies at the University of Georgia, where he's affiliated with the Sustainability Certificate Program and the Center for Integrative Conservation Research, otherwise known as ICON. He obtained his licensure in sociology from the University of Buenos Aires and his PhD in sociology from the State University of New York. His research on social movements, uh, environmental issues, and critical agrarian studies uses qualitative methods and focuses in South America. His book, Soybeans and Power, Genetically Modified Crops, Environmental Politics, and Social Movements in Argentina won the 2017 Outstanding Book Award um, of the Sociology of Development section for the American Sociological Association. We are so pleased to have Dr. LaPena here uh, this afternoon. And without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to him. Thank you very much, uh, Natagi, for the presentation, and Bruce for, for the invitation as well. I'm very excited uh, for being here. And uh, as you said, this is the title of my presentation, The Politics of Gen Crops and Agrochemical Exposure in Argentina. And I just want to clarify from the get-go that when I use terms uh, like GM crops or GM soybeans, I'm referring to crops that have been genetically engineered to resist an herbicide. That herbicide is sold as Roundup. You're probably familiar with that brand, Roundup, and the crops are called Roundup Ready, and that's a glyphosate-based agrochemical. And I'm putting that out there to clarify, but also we can have, com have a conversation about glyphosate which has uh, been embroiled in a global controversy as of recent years. So what I'm going to present are portions of my book published by Oxford University Press. The book is called Soybeans and Power, Genetically Modified Crops, Environmental Politics, and Social Movements in Argentina. And I, I will give you a quick uh, roadmap of what I will, will be presenting today. I'll talk First, about the puzzle that guides the narrative of the book and the questions. Uh, then I'll give you an overview of gene crops and agrochemical to then uh, zoom in on Argentina and Formosa, where I did my fieldwork. And then I'll go to the meat, so to speak, of the talk, the politics of gene crops. And then I'll finish with some takeaways and implications, again, zooming out from Argentina again, uh, to talk about things that you're probably also interested in, uh, like sustainable uh, development and environmental issues. So let me start with, the, with the, the events and the puzzle that guide the book. In 2003, agribusinessmen spread agrochemicals in fields of genetically modified soybeans in Monte Azul, a community in the province of Formosa in the north of Argentina. <clears throat> These agrochemicals were carried by the wind beyond areas of intended application and destroyed the crops grown by peasant families. Women, men, and especially children had headaches and muscular pains. They also had episodes of skin rushes, nausea, and vomiting. And these are the pictures that the peasants shared uh, with me. And the, the agrochemical spray, the drift, also uh, destroyed the crops that they eat every day, like those sweet potatoes that you see there, and also uh, the, the, the sweet potatoes and other vegetables that they sell on a local farmer market that I'll talk about more later on. So the peasants that were organized in a peasant movement, uh, they organized uh, several roadblocks in a community that I call Monte Azul. I use pseudonyms for the communities. 
Uh, they also occupied an airport that was used by uh, crop dusters, by crop duster, and they collectively sued the agrochemical demanding uh, a reparation for the damage to their farms and their health. But today their pleas still remain unanswered. Now, fast forward to 2009, six years after the events of 2003, the same families faced a comparable agrochemical exposure, causing also skin rushes, nausea, and respiratory problems. And also hundreds of chickens died in a few days. Those are, again, the pictures taken by the peasants. But no disruptive protests occurred following this very similar case of agrochemical exposure. So in both 2003 and 2009, people suffer health problems and damages to their crops and their animals due to the effects of herbicides using nearby fields of genetically modified soybeans. And there were these two very different uh, responses, contentious collective actions and no protests. So why did people from the same community first react by organizing protests, but later on remain apparently passive? So I take these two, these two moments in time to ask these broad questions. What are the uh, unfulfilled promises of GM crops in social and environmental terms? I'll get back to that at the end. What challenges do subordinate groups face when seeking to address environmental problems threatening their health and livelihoods? And how do subordinate groups resist, but also negotiate and accommodate environmental threats and agrarian change? So in the book, I uh, compare these two moments through three dimensions, uh, institutional politics and the role of authorities, uh, social movement organizations, both within and be between, and the subjective aspects of these processes, uh, focusing on the meanings they give to this and the emotions. The for today's purpose, I will focus mostly on, on the second and the third, to keep it as uh, short as I can. So, now, before getting to my study, let me give you a brief overview or, or a 10,000 foot perspective of, of GM crops and agrochemicals. So, when we talk about GM crops, we mostly, we, you know, overwhelmingly talk about four types of crops, cotton, corn, soybeans, and canola. Cotton and corn, the most widely used uh, genetically modified seeds, are pest resistant. These are called BT crops. And for soybeans and canola, these are called Roundup Ready crops because they resist or they tolerate this herbicide Roundup. Now, genetically modified crops, they don't have necessarily higher yields. That's a common uh, misconception. But the main advantage actually is that they simplify large scale production. And here's a quote of the National, National Academy of Sciences that explains that genetically engineered crops have the potential to protect yields in places where they have been introduced, but they do not have greater potential yield than non-GE genetically engineered counterparts. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is important because what I argue in the book uh, is that herbicide tolerant crops perpetuate uh, agrochemical use and create what uh, I call and other researchers call a transgenic treatment, right? And I can explain this become clear as I reach the, the end of the talk. Uh, but why is important to look at agrochemicals in connection to GM crops? So I want to give you, once again, a sort of very broad overview of the, of the issue at the global level, showing you just two, two graphs, two slides. The first slide, this one shows you the percentage, the, the seed companies that control the global market and the agrochemical companies that control that market, right? So if you look at the names, uh, I'll talk about the distribution in a second, but if you look at the names, Monsanto, and now become Bayer, uh, Dupont Dow, Syngenta, and on the, on the other side of the graph as well, these are the very same companies that uh, have intellectual property rights and the sell genetically modified seeds, right? So if you look at the uh, seed market, the top three companies control 61% of the global uh, market of seeds and the top four companies on the agrochemical market on the global agrochemical market the top four companies control 84 percent of the market and that gives you a first clue as to why you know i talk about a transgenic treadmill and how 
GM soybeans contribute to the problem of agrochemical exposure. Now, getting this, translating this into the territory, once again, very briefly. This is the global area of GM crops divided by country. And uh, as you can see here, uh, just a handful of countries, among them USA, Brazil, Argentina, and Canada, represent more than 75% of the global area planted with GM crops. And this is a very important phenomenon in Latin America because uh, of the total of the global area, 42% of that area is on Latin America, and that's uh, more than 72 million hectares. To give you an idea of what, what that landmass represents, that's five times the area of the state of Georgia. It's roughly five times the state of Georgia in terms of GM crops in Latin America. And Argentina was one of the first countries to adopt GM crops the same year that they were released here in the United States in 1986. And Argentina played a key role. That's why it's important that I'll talk to you a little bit about Argentina and then I'll take you to the northeast of the country. So this graph shows you the um, area planted with, with soybeans in Argentina. And uh, that happened, the adoption of GM soybeans, that's the red dotted line here, that happened in a context of, uh, profound, of a profound process of neoliberalization. Uh, neoliberalism, in case you've never heard the word, uh, is basically a, a set of policies that were very pro-business, policies that were adopted in Latin America and uh, particularly in Argentina in the 1990s. And in that context, and the context of increased global demand of GM soybeans, this production of, of GM soybeans mushroomed throughout Argentina. Now, today, Argentina, uh, in, in any given year, uh, 20 million hectares are planted with GM soybeans in Argentina, and that's half of the area under agriculture in the country. And again, to give you a point of comparison, 20 million hectares is roughly one and a half times the size of the state of Georgia. And that's 50 million tons a year, and it's one fourth of the exports of Argentina because virtually all of these uh, soybeans are exported and virtually all of these soybeans are genetically modified. And because of this herbicide resistance that I was mentioning earlier, this means that in any given year, 200, mi 200 million liters of glyphosate are sprayed in the countryside of Argentina. Now that, that number is even higher, um, but that, you know, this gives you the, this graph by Florencia Arancivia, a researcher who look at these issues. The, the blue bar here is the, you know, glyphosate use in Argentina, just to give you a quick uh, visual aid to, to wrap your head around this. So what I unpack uh, at the beginning of the book are the social and environmental impacts of this veritable story book. So, um, in Argentina, the production of soybeans first started in this area that I'm showing you here in my cursor, uh, like the dotted area here. And these are the Pampas, the plains. Uh, it's an export-oriented area similar to the Midwest here in, in the United States and uh, characterized by its commercial and large-scale agriculture, right? Now, in the early 2000s, the production of GM soybeans started to expand to the north of the country, these other provinces in the north that are shown with the, uh, you know, the dashes. Um, and in these areas, uh, you know, the rural uh, areas of these provinces are populated by peasants and indigenous groups in much smaller farms. And that creates a series of impacts that I call the dark side of the boom in reference to the soybean boom. And these impacts can be summarized in, in, in three points. First, there, there have been violent land evictions suffered by peasant and indigenous families, uh, deforestation to, to plant soybeans, and the appearance of what people call super weeds or weeds that start to resist glyphosate. So that forces farmers to use more toxic uh, chemicals. But what I focus mostly on is on cases of agrochemical exposure and the social environmental issues that uh, that, that creates. So I'll skip the methodological aspect of how I went about studying this in the north of Argentina. I can talk more about that in the Q&A and also about theory. 
But I want to take you to the north of the country where I did my field work in a province called Formosa near the border with uh, Paraguay, where I did my field work. Uh, and you know, long story short, in the 19th century, this area was colonized and indigenous peoples were dispossessed of their land. And throughout the 20th century, the province um, developed a dual agrarian structure with large ranches uh, with cattle and very small farms uh, of peasants growing cotton. And that's why the importance of the, the provincial coat of arms here, that it has a cotton plant, uh, cotton ball in the middle. And in the 1990s, uh, there were a series of neoliberal policies, or a process of neoliberalization, that created a series of problems for uh, small farmers, like this uh, that I show you here. These are pictures that I took uh, during my, my field work. And these farmers, these, these uh, peasants, sorry, were growing cotton as a cash crop. But what happened in the 1990s is that this process of neoliberal policies, business-friendly policies, created a series of problems because the, these policies eliminated subsidies for the production. Uh, they privatized cotton genes, uh, and by and large, they favored foreign investment and global cooperation. Right, so cotton. The bottom line for these small farmers or peasants was that cotton wasn't profitable anymore. So they reconverted to the production of vegetables to make some meats to make a living. And this is the, and hopefully this works. You can see. So this is a, a, a very amateur documentary that we did with some colleagues back in 2003, showing some images of the, this farmer market where they started to sell these vegetables, eggs, and other uh, produce. And uh, <clears throat> that experience was cut short by the agrochemical exposures or, or the agrochemical drifts that I'll talk about next. Because what happens with this expansion of soybeans from the center of the country to the north is that in provinces like Formosa, local landowners start to rent land uh, to agribusinessmen from the Pampa. And I put some numbers there that shows you how uh, the production of soybeans grew in this province of Formosa. That was very a, a very small area in 2000. By, by 2013, there were 10,000 acres, uh, 10,000 uh, hectares, sorry, planted with genetically modified soybeans. And these were plots of land, large plots of land, that were surrounded by very small plots of land where peasants were growing these vegetables to sell in local markets. So what happens is that throughout Argentina, people living close to uh, soybean fields are exposed to herbicides. Crop dusters, like the one that you see here on the left, or these machines that people call mosquitoes that you see on the uh, black and white picture, they spray herbicides, and it's very common that the wind uh, you know, carries away the herbicides to neighboring farms, and the runoff pollutes water and contaminates, and the, herb the herbicides contaminate the air. In the place where I did uh, my field work, I took these pictures of the elementary school, and in this picture on the left, uh, you see the kids, uh, you know, playing uh, football or soccer during recess, and all the area that you see behind this tree and the horizon line, that's uh, a soybean field. So when they spray herbicides here, as you can imagine, that reaches the, the school that you see here on the right. Also, you can see the soybean field in the back uh, here. And in the farms where people live, you also see how uh, you know, for instance, especially in the, the picture on the right, those plants that you see there right next to this uh, very humble house, uh, those are plants, uh, soybean plants. So when they you know, uh, spray on these plants, people live like just a few uh, feet away from where the plants are sprayed. So what happened in 2003 is, you know, there was this drift and that affected the cotton and the cassava that uh, peasant families grow. So the cotton plants were curved um, and the leaves start to, the, the cotton balls start to fall. The vegetables that they were growing started to wither and the cassava started also to wither and lose their, their leaves. 
So the peasants filed a police report, sent note to authorities, but they didn't get a response. So because they didn't get a response, they turned into collective action. They block a provincial road demanding a solution to their problem, but uh, that created a heated discussion between uh, peasants and government officials and agribusinessmen. So the provincial elites reacted by denial, victim blaming, and vilification. The officials said that the skin rashes and the soreness in the eyes and throats were a result of people not bathing very often. And they said that peasants should wash themselves with water and lye soap uh, to prevent those problems. Uh, for them, these health, pro health problems were due to a quote unquote lack of hygiene. And landowners also said that the protests were politically motivated and peasants were showing a dangerous attitude, quote unquote. So this further enraged uh, peasants. And in each and every interview that I, that I conducted, this issue came uh, spontaneously. Uh, so this response, you know, peasants said that they felt insulted by this. And this is what uh, Horacio, a spokesperson of the movement, told me. We trusted in the Ministry of Production and the Ministry of Human Development, and they let us down. They not only did not do anything positive, but we also felt insulted. They saw pimples and attributed them to the hygiene of the people without analysis, without review, without examining the patients. I also asked uh, Juana uh, how she felt about this, and she told me, I think that an educated person, supposedly more intelligent than us, the public officials, should know how to respect people. They thought, we'll tell them anything, so they just go away. That was the feeling I had, that they were telling us, go away, stay at home, and if you have to die, die. And Emilia uh, combined this sense of disrespect with the accusations of being politically motivated, saying they said that we were against the government, that that was the reason why we were complaining. And I don't know, Pablo, a movement, an organization always makes its claims about rights to the government. Isn't that so? That's why we get organized. Well, they see us as belonging to the opposition. And it's not true. They said we were just making things up, but they sure treated us as dirty, as calm, like nothing. So what do I get from this? interviews is that peasants wanted to recover their sources of food and income, but also they started to, they wanted to reverse the mistreatment and the disrespect of public officials. So what I started to notice is that in my research is that the public discourse about these issues was that GM soybeans and agrochemical, agrochemical exposure was an environment, environmental problem and an issue of corporate power. But a closer observation through ethnographic methods uh, showed me that this environmental discourse was important, but was intertwined with other meanings. Uh, in everyday talk, people connect these demands with demands for recognition. People were enraged by the denial of health and environmental problems, and their uh, environmental claims were intertwined with subsistence issues. And particularly women in, the, in these communities explain their contention in terms of mothers worried for the health of their children. Now, this is 2003. Fast forward to 2009, similar issues with respiratory problems, skin rushes, and peasant activists distributed leaflets, but they couldn't organize a rally and let alone a roadblock and the case didn't appear in the provincial media. So that's what inspired my research questions, you know, given these two similar cases. Why did people from the same community react very differently? What challenges do subordinate groups face when seeking to address environmental problems and threats to their health and livelihoods? And how do subordinate groups resist, but also negotiate and accommodate uh, threats to the environment and processes of agrarian change. So what I will talk next uh, is about how this plays out at the organizational level, how this connects to the social movement alliances and the internal relationships of the movement. And that speaks to the four point of the politics of GM crops that uh, brought us here. Right? So just a quick 
context, this happened at the national level in Argentina, so to zoom out from my field side for a second, uh, in the context of a Latin American pink tide. Uh, you know, governments that seek to move from free market policies to, to uh, promote state intervention in the economy. And in Argentina, that took the form of the government of Nestor Kirchner and Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. They implemented a series of Keynesian politica, uh, political um, economy or Keynesian economic policies that uh, were breaking away from the neoliberal pro-business policies of the 1990s. Right? Now, in terms of building a political power base for these changes, they enlisted the support of several social movements, including peasant movements. And President Christina Kirchner also implemented a series of rural welfare programs. So this is to say that this was an, a government that was you know, sympathetic and had some uh, connections and some affinities with these movements that I'll talk about next. The issue here, if we look at this at uh, several political scales from you know, the national political scale, but also the sub-national sub -national political scale, what happens here that is common in different parts of Latin America as well is that these governments create alliances with very authoritarian governments. And the governor of Formosa is a good case. He's been the governor since 1995, so he's been 25 in power uninterrupted. And this is important for this story because in this context, uh, peasant movements have very, uh, you know, a lot of problems or they struggle to maintain a certain level of autonomy, especially in places like Formosa, where patronage politics or clientelism is very prevalent. So what happens in this scenario uh, is that, you know, I try to capture these dynamics with this graph, is that the national government is both an ally of the provincial government, but also of the PESA movement. They, the national government supported both. The problem is that at the sub-national level, at the provincial level, what will be here the state, the governor and the PESA movement are opposed and continue, continuously uh, clashing and in conflict. Because as Emilia said in the, in the quote that I just uh, read, they see them as belonging to the opposition. So that creates a, a very complex scenario for the social movement, and this is how one of my interviews put it in, in, in a conversation. The thing is, we sometimes confront the government and we don't obtain anything, but we just make our people suffer. We will try other means, for example, presenting projects to the national ministry. I don't want to tell you that we have been defeated or that we have dropped our guard either. I think we should avoid confronting the governor and try to find alternative means to get what we want, which is what we are negotiating with the national government. They are allowing more participation from the organization. So the situation means that you know, the, the flow of resources that I'll unpack more next allows to keep the organization running but my argument that I show in the book is that this creates obstacles for contention and steer the movements toward negotiation and accommodation rather than you know, moving the, move, the, the movement towards contention and confrontation. And what this creates uh, is a situation of dual pressure. That's how I call it in the book. And so let me walk you, uh, you know, to this graph. Um, so in the, in the bottom corner, right? People, you know, the peasants who participate in the movement, the constituents, you know, they participate in the movement to voice their rights, uh, but also they participate because they expect that they're going to receive some welfare resources and that they expect that the movement is going to solve everyday problems, like, you know, how to sell my kid, send my kid to school if I don't have a fellowship, how to, you know, get uh, food in my table every week. Uh, how, you know, what do I do if I get sick and I don't have health insurance and I, and I need medicine, right? So all this, you know, creates um, what I call a pressure from below on the movement, right? So how do the movement in the middle, you know, addresses this or responds to this? You know, they support the national government, uh, you know, not for self-interest, but they have some, you know, uh, 
ideological you know things in common they 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 belong to the same political movement but through that involvement through those networks with the national government they receive welfare resources but that also creates what i call a pressure from above because the national government also is pressured by the provincial government saying hey how come that you give resources to these people who are the you know the opposition they say in my province right so this double you know pressure from below of constituents demanding you know some sort of resources to make ends meet and this pressure from above because of these multiple alliances creates this dual pressure that i argue in the book and i explain more that ends up demobilizing the movement and this is how Nelida, one of uh, <clears throat> the people in the, the leaders of the movement, put this, this process of that I call dual pressure. We had to join the people from Buenos Aires so that our mates, nuestros compañeros, could have a bit more help. If no one gives us anything, the organization will crumble. It will fall down. People aren't doing fine, and if they get some help, we realized that through the organization, we could negotiate and obtain welfare plans for our compañeros. If we don't do anything and if we cannot give anything to our people, nothing at all can be done. They are all poor and with some help, they're joined together. It's not that much, but we are keeping up and growing. So <clears throat> what happens is that, you know, this excuse contention, and this is how Oscar put it in an interview. The nation, the national government, didn't give us even one peso yet. But we're already busy thinking what agricultural machinery we're going to buy, how are we going to spend the money coming from the uh, Secretary of, of Welfare, uh, Rural Welfare, and that distracts us from the struggle. So, <clears throat> in spite of these concerns, you know, peasants know that they still need to participate and engage with the government because otherwise they will be sidelined. It's not that they are being quote unquote co opted or manipulated, right? They are very aware of what they're doing, but they don't see other way out. So, to compare these two and, and, and trying to uh, you know zoom zoom out of Argentina a little bit. In 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 the book, I explain this more, but just to give you the summary, I compare these two events. I use them as a device to to talk about three issues. Institutional politics is the first. So, what happens between these two points in time is that the situation moves from denial and disrespect to forms of recognition. And I, don't, I didn't talk uh, a lot about this today, but the government creates a whole, whole series of agencies and, and projects, and also in discourses and speeches, they recognize uh, peasants. And that, all, that creates uh, disincentives or uh, problems for mobilization. Uh, the second issue is that in through these two points in time what happens in the process is that social movements demobilize through the uh, process of dual pressure that i just explained to you and that i'll be happy to unpack more i hope that was that was clear and the third issue is that what happens is that uh, in, in in terms of subjective strategies and, and emotions people move from being enraged in 2003 to being despaired and favor uh, accommodation over contention. I unpack this more in the book. I'll just give I just give you the the, the summary. But uh, to wrap up and and have time for for conversation and questions, what are the takeaways of all these? Right, if we zoom out from Argentina, so I see four implications of uh, this case. You know, more broadly considered, the first are epistemological. How can how should we analyze these issues? The second is environmental, right? The connection between agriculture, ecosystems, and global challenges. The third one is social. You know, what are the goals of food production and who wins and who loses in the current food system? And the last one has to do with development, meaning how can we improve the lives of disenfranchised populations? These are more like, you know, very broad questions. Hopefully, we can have a conversation about them and are closely connected to the uh, sustainable development goals. That's why I put them here too. So in terms of this, what I call epistemological implications, what I want to be clear about is that this critical approach to GM crops is not anti. You know, it's very common to, to hear in public uh, conversations that criticizing 
uh, genetically modified crops is anti-science or anti-progress, right? Well, actually, what I think, and other people also, <clears throat> is that, you know, thinking that we should stop discussing this or we should stop examining gene crops is actually a very un anti-science position, right? If science is, you know, based on skepticism and keep asking questions and keep researching, uh, you know, what is what is pro-science is to have a broader view of sciences, right? So when when it comes to uh, genetically modified crops or genetically engineered crops, we need the natural sciences and also we need a broader spectrum and include the social sciences as well. And even within the natural sciences, there are a lot of issues that still need to be answered. For example, the synergistic effects of agrochemicals, something that is very hard to investigate. Uh, so this is not a, you know, being critical about gene crops is not anti-science, but it's actually, you know, a scientific uh, position to take. And and this has to do with, you know, asking questions about what what is technology for and what techno what what goals. Uh, you know, technology should achieve. And my case study, what shows is the embeddedness of agriculture biotechnology, right? That technology cannot be disentangled from the social context, especially when the products of uh, agricultural biotechnology leave the lab and go to the world or to the fields. <clears throat> Second, in terms of environmental implications, uh, what I show in my study is that uh, herbicide resistant crops actually perpetuate agrochemical use and monoculture that is a big environmental issue if we look towards the future. For example, and this is clearly seen in the, in the case of uh, herbicide resistant weeds, weeds that now used to be killed by glyphosate but not anymore, obviously because of natural selection, right? And what that creates is a trans transgenic treadmill. And but what I mean by that is that, you know, when, when companies and farmers start to see that certain herbicides uh, do not kill certain weeds, so weeds develop resistance, the way of quote unquote solving this problem is not to think outside the box or rethink the way that, you know, we produce feed and food, but rather to come up with new GM crops that resist, uh, you know, um, resist other herbicides like 2,4-D and Dicamba is the newest uh, iteration of this that's creating a lot of problems here and there. So a potential solution of all this uh, is agroecology and obviously I don't have time to unpack all this but uh, even the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the FAO, is, is uh, you know taking agroecology as one of the solutions to get out of the current uh, situation that we're in, in terms of uh, environmental issues and, and global um, and the climate crisis, right? Agriculture is a big contributor to uh, um, household, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to global warming and, you know, moving away from a model that is heavily dependent on fossil fuels could be, you know, could contribute to tackle the current climate crisis. Uh, the social implications of all this is that, you know, this case is just one case, but I think it could be, uh, it is a good example of what happens throughout Latin America is that the discourse of, of genetically modified soybeans to quote unquote feed the world uh, is, is ha has a lot of shortcomings, right? Uh, one of them is that, you know, animal, uh, you know, these, these uh, crops are not created to you know, uh, feed the world, but actually to feed you know pigs in China, for example, or to uh, create oil that is then used to cook uh, animal protein, right? So these are uh, inputs of the industry rather than than food, like corn and soybeans in, in particular, right? So that lead us lead me to to you know ask the question: Well, what is the the goal of economic uh, growth, who benefits uh, with uh, this idea of continuous economic growth, and what is the cost of, uh, you know, growing uh, continuously. And in the case of gene crops, it's clear that, you know, they favor the corporate food system and they clearly, you know, are produced as commodities for market and not uh, to feel the hungry, the, you know, hungry people in, in the world. 
And it actually, in many situations, like the case that I just uh, explained to you, these this crops actually increase the economic uh, vulnerability of both countries and families. Like Argentina has like, you know, one fourth of the exports are based on GM soybeans. So it, it, that makes for a very fragile, you know, uh, strategy of development. And for families, as you can see, you know, uh, GM crops in the case of North Argentina, at least, uh, rather than improving food security, it made families more food insecure. Now, I think, you know, uh, uh, a social science view of all this is important because these social uh, and environmental impacts uh, can can be missed if we don't take into account you know the the social dynamics at, at play and that's why i talk a little bit of of discrimination in this context because whose voices are heard in the public discourse are really important to to address this in a in a just manner and lastly, the last point is, are the development implications of this, right? Uh, at least in South America, uh, it can be said very clearly that GM crops do not benefit the rural poor, neither solve food access, rather impair food access, as I just explained, and I can talk more about that if you want. And the reality is that it furthers marginalized, disenfranchised populations and, and pushes away small farmers or peasants that could be really key to contribute to local uh, networks of food production and redistribution. And in fact, the National Academy of Science, you know, uh, you know, put these issues in these terms. GE crops, like other technological advances in agriculture, are not able by themselves to address fully the wide variety of complex challenges that face small holders. And, and why that is important, because you know, what, what you also hear frequently is like, you know, Jim Cross are one tool in the box, right? But the problem is that putting so many resources and attention in that sidelines all the solutions, like, you know, the use of appropriate technologies or the promotion of agroecology. So I want to keep it under 40 minutes, so I, I stop here, but I'm very grateful to all these people in my field site that contributed to my study, and, I, and I'm very grateful to you for, for making time to, to hear my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. LaPena, for um, a very um, interesting and eye-opening talk. Um, I, I personally have a lot of interest in uh, GMOs and, and really um, what you brought up about um, kind of continuing our inquiry. Um, you know, let's not stop asking questions. Um, and yeah. to do that is not, you know, anti-science. Um, it's it's actually, in my opinion, also, um, you know, what science is about. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, we do have a couple of comments and questions that have started to um, gather in the chat. And so let me just mm -hmm. try to field those for you. If I can scroll up. Um, so the first question is, um, are there groups, uh, were, were the groups that you studied connected to uh, via Campesina or any other global networks for food sovereignty or environmental justice? And then kind of what is your thought, what are your thoughts on the ability for such networks to support local campaigns um, and to help them build power? Great, uh, that, that's, a, that's a, a great question. Uh, so the first part of the question is, is uh, yes, somehow. So the specific movement that I started in Argentina is not formally associated to Via Campesina, but they are uh, part of a broader network in Argentina that where other movements are uh, connected to Via Campesina. Uh, the one that is the strongest one in Argentina is called uh, Mocase, M-O-C-A-S-E, and, and that's the local chapter of, of Via Campesina in Argentina. And what they have been doing a lot of uh, important work, like uh, pushing the United Nations to recognize small farmers uh, at, at the global uh, level. There's also a great, uh, you know, the question remind me of a great resource also for teaching or speaking of like one of the missions of this uh, network. Uh, Via Campesina has a, has a great, uh, you know, 50 minute or so clip uh, called Together We Cool the Planet, where they unpack a lot of the issues that are brought at the end, meaning how, you know, how uh, corporate agriculture contributes to climate change and what can we uh, do about it? Um, 
And there was a second part of the thing of the question that I may be missing. Um, the second part of the question was, um, what are your what are your thoughts on the ability for such networks? Oh, uh, okay. To 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 support uh, to support local campaigns and help them to build power. Yes. Uh, no, I think there's a lot of promise uh, into these global networks. What I do also argue, I have a, a, an article that I published this year in, the, in a journal called the Journal of Peasant Studies, where uh, I uh, argue with my uh, co-author, Tamara Peremuter from Argentina, that um, the, you know, focusing on, on Via Campesina is a double-edged sword, in the sense that on one hand, because Via Campesina is so, you know, uh, large, such a large organization with a global reach, uh, that gives them the, you know, the ability to to influence the agenda, right? But on the other hand, I mean, uh, our beef is not with Via Campesina per se, but the, what we argue in the article is that a lot of researchers uh, focus a lot on Via Campesina, which is important. But that comes to the, uh, you know, with the cost or with the problem of losing sight of very local organizations like the one that I study, uh, that are not, you know, they, they, they are not associated to Via Campesina or they, they are, they act very locally and they don't like have the resources or the capacity to, to reach to the global level. So we, we risk, you know, the, you know, we, by only focusing on Via Campesina, we may lose track or, or we might kind of like obscure local and small organizations that very that are very important because those are the ones who are very close to the territory or the to the terrain. Um, so so just to add like a uh, you know yes, Via Campesina is great, but also let's also pay attention to more localized uh, you know organizations. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so it's another comment session. Um, it says, I hear tension between ideology and pragmatism, and a finding that pragmatism um, solves some of the problems with ideology. In the USA and other countries, uh, just moved away from me and do this again, uh, with other questions coming in the chat. So in the USA, other countries now struggling with populist movements, we are seeing renewed vigor um, of ideological positions. Does mm -hmm. your work offer any thoughts about how these countries could find ways to concentrate on pragmatic issues and avoid um, those ideological conflicts? Mm. Yeah, that's uh, you know a very good question and, and uh, you know a very <laughs> complex one. I wish I had like a, the answer to to that. Uh, what what I can say in terms of 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 that sort of like tension between you know ideology and pragmatism, right? Uh, so what I see that tension, uh, you know, the, the question reminds me a lot of, of something that I also witnessed during my field work, during uh, during uh, this meeting of activists, uh, and they were like trying to come up with like, okay, so what can we do about this agrochemical drift, right? Like, and 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 one position, you know, one group of people. Their argument was, well, we should create some buffers, right? We should like push for legislation that creates like a 500 meters, which would be like, uh, well, sorry, I can translate that to fit, uh, but like to, to create buffers between, you know, soybean production and other like schools or, or people's houses or uh, smaller farms. And, and the other, you know, camp, they were both, you know, in sync in terms of being both like worried about the issue and activists. But the other, you know, group in the room will say, well, but you know, if you just create that, you know, those buffers, you know, you're not you're not questioning the broader thing of like monocultures and you know the use of agrochemicals in general. Uh, so that's just like a band aid to a huge problem. Uh, and 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 to that, the other side will reply, well, sure, but like if we expect you know, to move to uh you know a, a time where you know we we go beyond monoculture and we arrive to a new era or uh, the, the terms of the use is like uh, if we wait for an agricultural revolution that's you know not going to happen anytime soon and people are going to keep getting sick and dying uh because of these uh exposures right so um that that tension i think is always 
always present between uh, you know how can you, you know, bring about concrete solutions, but how those solutions may also may, may just be sort of like a little patch that doesn't address you know the the the, the broader you know uh, issues. There's a there's a and I finish with this. There's a great book that I read uh, this year that just came out by an anthropologist. His name is Craig Heatherington. Uh, the book is called, I have it right here, it's called The Government of Beans uh, by Duke University Press. And it's all about soybeans, uh, genetically modified soybeans in Paraguay. The subtitle is Regulating Life in the Age of Monocrops. So if you are interested in this question about you know, the tension between ideology and pragmatism, you know, like idealism and like concrete solutions, th this could be a good start because it tackles the, a government in Paraguay that really a national government that really try to 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 pro provide solutions to issues of agrochemical exposure but it shows also all the tensions and and contradictions and and, and pitfalls of trying to do that thank you so much um, that's very helpful and could you the the name of that book again was what is the government of beans the know, government uh, of beans yeah okay. uh, Craig Heatherington is uh, is the author. Um, maybe I can write you the name here. Is there a chat? There I is a chat. chat. Um, yeah, in fact, I, I was I was starting it up. Um, but yeah, you can put that, that in there. Thank you so yeah, much. That's the name of the of the author. He's an anthropologist in in uh, I think Concordia University in Canada and and a good friend. Okay. But the book is really good. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so I do have a question. Um, something that stood out to me about your talk was um, just your mention of sort of the synergistic effects of these chemicals. Yeah. Um, are there um, scholars that you might point us to who are studying uh, those synergistic effects or even some of the cumulative um, effects that people may be experiencing um, as a result of exposure to these chemicals? Yeah, so you know that that you know uh, I, I may get a little technical here, so I hope they like it's, it's not too uh, too boring. But the the issue with with agrochemicals or one of them is, is that you know uh, the International Agency of Research on Cancer uh, is an agency that depends from the World Health Organization. Uh, not long ago, in 2015, recategorized glyphosate as probably carcinogenic. So glyphosate is the active principle on Roundup, right? And uh, you probably have seen this in the media if you follow this issue. There's been like literally thousands of of lawsuits uh, brought against now Bayer, it used to be Monsanto, because for because people getting sick or, or getting uh, particularly non-Hodgkin lymphoma and that they attribute to you know their exposure to glyphosate, right? Um, now, the issue is that Roundup, which is the herbicide, you know, the herbicide I sold in the market, it has glyphosate, which is the active principle, but also has a lot of other substances, right? And like adjuvants uh, to you know, make the, the, the chemical stick to the plants, um, a, a lot of different substances that, you know, there's not enough uh, research on how those substances, you know, interact with each other and how it affects us. And second is that, uh, as you mentioned, you know, is, as your question suggests, you know, typically what 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 is studied in the laboratory is like how one, you know, chemical in this case glyphosate affects, you know, people, right? Uh, because it's a, it's a very complex, as as you can you know. Uh, now uh, it's a very you know difficult process to 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 show and actually demonstrate uh, you know the effect uh, of of one chemical and and the mechanism through which this happens right the biological mechanisms uh, the problem is that you know people are we are not exposed to one chemical <laughs> we are exposed to to a multiple uh, multiple chemicals so um, and and in the case of soybeans what happens is that uh, that's that becomes like a reality because this this weeds that start to resist Roundup, you know, starting to appear for some years now. And even the industry clearly is not like 
sociologists are bringing this up, like the industry and the Wheat Society of uh, America also recognize that this is an issue, this is a problem. So what happens is that farmers started to use you know, other chemicals to, to kill those weeds that they cannot kill with Roundup. So they start to use, for example, uh, 2,4-D. That's one. Uh, that's another herbicide. Um, now, also, like uh, these companies release a soybean that resists uh, yet another herbicide called dicamba. That is very volatile. That's created a lot of problems of, of drift in, uh, you know, Arkansas and other uh, uh, states in the Midwest. So people living in these places are, you know, exposed to this cocktail, right, of very, you know, several uh you know um herbicides also if you if you say if you live on the countryside and your left people grow soybeans you're exposed to glyphosate and on the right they grow corn so you're exposed to atrazine another uh herbicide that is very prone uh for for runoff because it, it, it it's very easy for that chemical to to get into uh water streams so uh and there are not enough studies on that so that's um that's a big issue and a resource that a couple of uh oh sorry uh a couple of uh i was trying to open the chat and i do something else ah, there you go i'm trying to i'm not very familiar <laughs> with with blue G here you go chat uh, i'm gonna write down so uh, i want to recommend uh, a couple of books one is called band which is a history of, uh, I can't remember the name of uh, the author, I have it somewhere here. So that's one, uh, one book that, that looks at the history of toxicology and, and it's a good place to, to look at the, you know, how all the, the issues, uh, it's a book on history, uh, but, but looks at that. And another one, uh, I was trying to find the book, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you the name of the author. It's a, Alisa Corner. Uh, is a sociologist, and uh, she she doesn't look. Um, her work is on PFAS, uh, this like persistent chemicals. Uh, so it's not about our culture, but um, but if you look her up, she has a book on this, and uh, and also a, a, a research project that that's starting to look uh, at at uh, you know how we. Uh, are exposed to a series of different chemicals and and how little we know about the health effects of of that so those could be a, a couple of places to start thank you so much that's very helpful um i'm going to we're at um a little after one o'clock now so i'll okay. ask if there are any other uh remaining questions to go ahead and put them in the chat uh, and we'll get them to dr la pena um and if not, let me go ahead and make an announcement about our next, um, about the next um, virtual uh, series or, or virtual um, seminar in this series. Um, there is definitely lots of praise for your presentation. Um, you. I saw several mm -hmm. comments that said this is the best presentation about GMOs <laughs> that I've ever experienced. So um, I think Great. many of us can just really echo that um, very, opening presentation on today um, our next the next one in this series and I hope that I'm getting this date correct so um, Bruce if you can correct me um, I think our next um, our next um, seminar will be on January the 22nd and our presenter on that day will be um, Dr. Um, Elora Raymond who is an assistant professor uh, in the School of City and Regional Planning at Georgia, uh, at Georgia Tech. I'm sorry. Um, and sh her topic will be migration following Hurricane Michael, evidence from the consumer credit panel. Um, so that will be, uh, I think, an interesting um, dialogue as we um, talk about uh, issues related to climate change, um, disaster and disaster recovery. Um, and what that means uh, for um, different groups. So that will be our seminar for January the 22nd, um, which will be um, our next installment uh, after the new year. Uh, so let me just see, I don't see that anything else has come into the chat other than praise for your um, very enlightening presentation today. And um, so I think we will, and let's see. I just added um, another book that I read recently 
the chemical okay. age, which also like yeah. an interesting book to you want to look at the history of of uh, it has a very enlightening uh, chapter about DDT. Uh, it's very interesting to read, uh, you know, that in light of the, the the current controversy over glyphosate, because you know the author like uh, shows you how when DDT came out, it was this, like this wonderful you know tool and like how widespread it was and while I was reading, you know, like it, it, I, I heard like echoes all the time about glyphosate, like kind of like how the, the industry and a lot of scientists as well, like, you know, praise glyphosate years, you know, years back. And now some evidence starting to emerge that it may not uh, be as wonderful as, as uh, people originally. That's another interesting resource to look at. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I mean, it definitely makes me think of um, work on the precautionary principle. Um, yes. There's so many things that, you know, they've they've made it to market, they are used, um, and we find out later um, that there can be these detrimental effects. And so I think there is mm -hmm. so much, so much to be said about being conservative in our use, especially of synthetic chemicals, um, in terms of how they uh, can and do impact human health as well as the environment. Um, so Absolutely. thank you so much for, for bringing that up as well. Um, there are a couple of messages in the chat for folks. Um, if you are not, not a part of the Higher Education Learning Committee, uh, community, excuse me, um, for the RCE Greater, Greater Atlanta, and you'd like to join uh, or like to be on the, the email list, um, there is contact information in the chat. So we invite you to become a part um, of this community and of, of this network. Um, and uh, we look forward uh, to seeing uh, folks in the new year. Um, so we have Thanksgiving coming up. I'll say uh, happy Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, happy holidays. Um, and we're definitely looking forward to um, a different 2021. I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah. um, so I don't know if there are any other, if Bruce or anybody else wants to come on mic to say anything. Um, if not, then we will, we will close out. Just to say thank you, Pablo, for a, a very stimulating presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I, I put a lot there, so uh, feel free to, you know, to email me if you have any further questions or, or you know, if I can point you out to, you know, other uh, resources that may be helpful for you to keep thinking about these issues. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was great. <laughs> Thank you, Pablo. Thank you. Happy holidays.